we haven't heard anything about Matt Eberflus's future yet. And although we don't know exactly what's going to happen and it could surprise us all, there is a good chance that Matt Eberflus will be here. So Lauren, I'm going to ask you, what does he bring to the table? That's exceptional that another coach couldn't bring. And when you do think of the elite coaches in this league, is there anybody that you could compare his traits and characteristics to? I think it's a great question to ask and I, and I will try and answer it, but I, I think that's the question that not a lot of not, not enough people are asking themselves. Like, the Bears defense clearly played better in the second half of this past season, and Matt Eberflus is the defensive coach. But like, if you think about like what what Matt Eberflus does on this defense, like what has his role been in this defense playing better? It's it's really hard to sit here and pinpoint like the specific thing or things that Eberflus does really really well as a head coach or a defensive coordinator. Like he's not calling you know, the, the world's most creative coverages, right? He's not, he's not coming up with, you know, crazy disguises or just brand new ways of thinking or shifting coverages or certain calls, like adjustments off of certain coverages that guys are adjusting to. And like, you know, they're passing off routes in a certain way that is really innovative or creative. I don't know that we uh, can objectively say like, this is the best way to, but like, this is the percentage of cover two that you should call versus the percentage of cover four. Like there's no way to, to really like, measure and pinpoint okay Eberflus is calling the right mix of coverages better than other coaches are calling the right mix of coverages so like to me the answer like to answer your question is very little like there's very little that Matt Eberflus that I can see that we can measure in any real way that Matt Eberflus does at a highly exceptional effective level that other coaches wouldn't be able to do you know I don't know if devil's advocate is the right word there like the thing that he does exceptionally that other coaches can't do is that he's been here for two years. You know, he knows all of these players on the roster right now better than any coach coming in from the outside would. Probably the only thing I could think of as well is at a point where we got four turnovers against the Lions and still blew that lead and lost that game. At the end of that, I said, this team's done. They're not going to try as hard for this coach again. And next week they did. So I, I give him credit for not losing the locker room during losing because, yeah, when you're winning, it's easy to hold a locker room together. But when you're losing, that's when it gets bad. And that's definitely a positive like that. He's got that uh, for sure. He has the faith of the locker room a lot more than if any every new coach that we brought in would have to build that faith up. And he already has some of that. And that's it's not meaningless. That's not nothing. Sure. Like it's good and important that the players do like him. But it feels like any coach who wins the players will like them. the players like to win. And I guess give him credit for holding the locker room together last year during a terrible season where there wasn't much winning and players could have easily kind of turned on the team and given up and not tried hard. And like he deserves credit for some aspects of leadership and, and locker room management. One other thing is that you look at you do look at the coverages the Bears ran this season. Uh, first four weeks of the season, right up to the Washington game, week five, and they had the mini bye week afterwards. From that point, drastic change in the coverage calls that they use like week one through five when the defense is really bad they set a lot of cover two, a lot more soft zone not much man coverage after week five and on he, he definitely like you can see in the data like looked at what he was calling as a cover for terms of coverages as a play caller and changed it and it was much better from that point on and like he deserves credit for that in terms of self-scouting and not being so married to his cover two system from the past that he has to keep forcing that over and over again. He did adapt and change, and that did, I think, contribute to some degree to better defensive performance. Like Mike Tomlin, I don't know what you necessarily say is his thing and the stability. Um, John Harbaugh, for example, is much more of a of a CEO type. He's a special teams coordinator. He doesn't call plays on either side, but it's just like a stable force. And it's a he's a good listener. He really listens to what his players need. He makes adjustments based on what he's what they're good at and what they need to do. So there is something about stability and flexibility. Um, but I don't I don't need that from a guy who also calls plays at a mediocre level and all that stuff. So like if you are that guy, then you really better be really good at hiring offensive and defensive coordinators. You better be really good at managing and managing your actual like corporation of coaching staff. Like, I don't know how, how much involvement Matt Eberflus had with handpicking his coaching staff, but one guy was fired for reasons to be known. And the other guy is arguably a bottom five offensive coordinator. Players, it was a good call by the, by the, whoever this coordinator was. That was, that would be me. Did you, did you hear that? Let me just replay that really quickly. 
we just replaced a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was and that would that would be me so with whatever stability and play calling ability and all that that you can bring to the table if you can't manage your own staff at the micro at the macro level i don't trust that you can like go down all the way into the nitty gritty of your team and on a mic on a uh, micro level be a good manager of like men and all that stuff. They could like you all the, uh, all that you want. Like I do like that uh, Lawrence at one point like worked his way to the nicest way of saying like he's there. <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> if you do keep flus, you do need to add a defensive coordinator to the staff and a, a stable offensive coordinator. I mean, I don't think Luke gets you sticking around. I think the, uh, most Bears fans are on the same page there that that needs to change. So, with that being said, does anybody come to mind? Yeah, I think defensive coordinator wise, I, I look first at guys currently on the coaching staff. It seems like Iberflus, having just been the defensive coordinator all year, I don't know that he's needs to go out and get a totally new outside voice. Like I, I've been asked before, like you know, Lovey Smith as a possibility there, and I mean, I, I guess, or I mean, there was talks of him trying to get Rod Marinelli out of retirement, but Rod kind of declined that too. Like I don't think, I don't think either one of those is super likely, but. I mean, right on the coaching staff, they've kind of made John Hoke, the cornerbacks coach. It's kind of felt like he's been the de facto veteran defensive coach that everyone talks to as though he's the defensive coordinator without having any of the defensive coordinator, you know, like pay or title or responsibilities at this point. But I mean, he's been an NFL defensive coordinator before for a few different teams, I believe. And he's certainly been a college defensive coordinator for a long time. And, he's, you know, he's a veteran coach. I think he would make a lot of sense in that spot. Also, if that's, the, if that's the case, though, why wouldn't they have promoted him this year? That's a good, that's, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I don't know why, I don't know why they didn't just bother promoting someone this year. I mean, even as an interim defensive coordinator, why, why it seemed like it would have made sense either way to put someone in that role. Okay.